Okay. I start? Okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the TCSS talk. The talk will be an, uh, about an hour long and then there will be a Q&A session. Both will be live streamed on YouTube and also recorded. To ask questions, please write them into the YouTube chat or there will be a possibility to join the Zoom call for the Q&A. The link will be posted in the YouTube chat right before the Q&A. Now let me introduce our today's speaker, Professor Marianne Holmes. Marianne Holmes is a professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. Her research is concentrated on understanding the processes which occur during the melting and solidification of rocks. This includes the formation and segregation of crustal melts and the evolution of the crystal mash forming at the margins of cooling magma chambers. Please welcome Professor Holmes. Professor Holmes, the stage is yours. Thanks very much. And thanks very much for um, inviting me to give this talk. Um, I have to say this is my first time I've given a talk over Zoom. So um, yes, I'm slightly trepidatious, shall we say. Okay, right. So I'm gonna be talking about how we can infer how previously liquid magma behaved from bodies of magma that are now fully solidified. Okay, so I can get this. No, I can't get this. I have to go here and right. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking about magma chambers. Now, what is a magma chamber? It's, um, it's a body of magma that's stalled in the crust. I mean, it's supposed to get up and, and erupt at the surface, but sometimes the driving force pushing it up, the gravitational driving force, mostly with gas bubbles, isn't enough to get it all the way up. So it just sits in the crust here. Now, the, the rocks, it's surrounded by a cold. So that magma chamber is cooling from all sides. Um, so that's going to drive crystallization. Now, um, the old idea of, of what happens under volcanoes is that you've got a large vat of very liquid rich magma that just crystallizes slowly um, from the walls inwards. But um, the more recent understanding is that under most volcanoes or most volcanic systems, we actually get a column, a transcrustal column of partially melted, partially solidified magma. So we don't get this sort of nicely liquid, um, liquid rich magma anymore, or at least not at present. But um, what I'm going to be talking about is a couple of examples where we did have this situation here, okay? And those two examples, there's one in Greenland and there's one up in Scotland. And I'll be talking about those and showing how we can use our um, observations on the outcrop scale, you know, to sort of meter scale, 100 meter scale, and also on the grain scale using the microscope to work out whether this magma here was convecting or not. Now, um, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the composition of any magma that's erupted at the surface depends on how much crystallization happened while that magma was trapped in the crust. And not only that, but how much um, of those early formed crystals were removed from the rain remaining magma. Okay, because that is going to affect the viscosity and the composition of the magma that gets erupted. Okay, so this example here, this is a really lovely film from um, Hawaii, which shows some basalt just pouring down a hill. Um, and basalt is extremely low viscosity. It's very, very runny. So this is like primitive magma, if you, if you like. It hasn't actually lost many of those crystals. It's just, just coming out pretty much as it was. Um, all right. Okay. Um, so this is just another example of that low viscosity magma. Um, it can form sort of explosive eruptions, but they're not that explosive. The sort of things you get with this low viscosity magma are these really rather wonderful fire fountains. So they're maximum, I don't know, about 100 meters high and they're really um, not that dangerous at all. Now, if we go to a magma chamber, which had significant cooling and loss of those crystals, those early formed crystals from the resultant magma, the, the magma that we get out is really high viscosity. So this is a time lapse video. You can see this is, this is just a couple of photographs every day um, through 2006 and 2007 of um, some andesitic lava 
that's erupting at the summit of Mount St. Helens, which is one of the volcanoes in the Cascades in um, Western North America. Okay, and it was actually moving very, 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 very slowly. It can't, it's so viscous that it can't actually form a normal flow. And in fact, with this kind of magma, um, if there's a lot of gas in it and you can't get the gas out, then you'll end up with an extraordinarily explosive, dangerous climate changing eruption. So this is actually Mount St. Helens when it blew up um, in 1989. Okay, highly, highly explosive eruption. So um, the question of how we separate early formed crystals from the solid that they're growing in is dominated by the fluid dynamics of the system. How sticky was it? How quickly could the crystals settle out and, and be separated? And a lot of that is determined by, you know, the convective behavior of the magma. So we really do need to know what the fluid, fluid dynamical behavior is of our magma when it's stalled in the crust. OK, so we've got this this problem that, you know, most of the most volcanoes have got the active magma chambers sitting underneath them. You know, we can't actually say anything about what's going on underneath the volcano because we can't get down there. So the way to look at it is to look at ancient bodies that solidified in the crust. And now they're at the surface because erosion has taken the top of them. And then we can just walk out over them and and, you know, look at them in enormous detail. Um, but you know, we've lost information because they're now completely solid. So the question is, how can we look at these ancient now solid bodies and work out what their fluid dynamical behavior was when they actually solidified? Okay, so where are we going to go? Well, um, this, this um, map of the earth here shows these it, regions in red where we've got large outpourings of basaltic volcanism. And they're all um, related to upwelling plumes in the convecting mantle, in the solid convecting mantle. And they're known as hotspots, and that's what each of these yellow dots is. Now there's a hotspot currently underneath Iceland. And this hotspot started being active about 60 million years ago. And at that time, Greenland was joined up with Northern Europe. The North Atlantic didn't exist. And the arrival of this upwelling plume from the mantle triggered the splitting of, of the ancient continent and the opening of the North Atlantic. And that it was associated with, and is still associated with, large amounts of basaltic volcanism. So we've got this red stripe here along the East Greenland coast and also down in um, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So we're going to be looking at an example over here in Greenland and an example over here in Scotland. Okay. So this is just a close up map there. So there's Iceland. That's where the hotspot is currently active. It's currently um, pouring out basaltic volcanism. Got the Faroe Islands on this side, all this black stuff here. This is the Isle of Skye, Mull, Ardnamurchan, um, Arran as well. These are all volcanoes associated with that splitting of Greenland away from um, Northern um, Europe. And we've got some activity over here but where we're going to go at the moment actually we're going to go just there in East Greenland. What does the coast of East Greenland look like? Well this is a rather spectacular view of um, that part of East Greenland um, and everything you can see there that isn't snow and ice is basaltic lava flows. You can see these horizontal layers here each one of these is a separate lava flow so you've had enormous amounts of outpouring of basaltic magma all the way over um, that part of East Greenland. This is just a simple cross section of um, that, the East Greenland coast. So we've got a lot of faulting and stretching of the continent associated with the opening of the North Atlantic. And these, those are the lavas, this gray color here is the lavas. 60 million year old lavas. These are later sediments, so we don't need to worry about them. And this is the original continental crust that was there before the lavas all came pouring out. Now what we're going to look at, look at is a body of magma that was supposed to be a lava flow, it was destined to be a lava flow, but it got trapped at the contact between the older lavas here and this original bit of continental crust. And it's known as the Scareguard intrusion. And it was found by Lawrence Wager 
He was a professor at Oxford. So this is one of the views from um, 1936, which is when he found it. Um, it rather spectacular um, black and white um, photograph. And it's these mountains here. This is sort of, you can see the edge of it there. I'll show you a better photograph of this um, shortly, but there is the edge of it and it's coming around like this. So over here, this is all the basalt, those lava flows that it got trapped underneath. And over here is the original continental crust as it just sort of got stuck on. So there's a geological map here, which we don't really need to worry about. That aerial view is over here looking in this direction. And what we have is a body of magma that got stuck in the crust a couple of kilometers below the surface. And it's about 10 kilometers this way and 10 kilometers that way and about four kilometers deep. Now you might think that's enormous, but actually it's quite small um, in relation to other magma bodies trapped in the crust. This is on, on the small side when it comes to this kind of intrusion. But um, importantly, there's the rifting of the North Atlantic has rotated this body. So the floor is now here and you can now walk up avoiding this glacier, you can walk up to the roof and the wall of it is really well exposed around here, almost completely. This wall here is, is covered in glaciers for a lot of it. But what we know is that this body of magma solidified downwards from the roof, there are these layers here, upwards from the floor and then inwards from the side, okay? Um, so this is a little cartoon basically giving the game away that, you know, there, there's our overlying basaltic lavas, the older ones. Here is that pale coloured rock that was the original um, continental crust. And this is just a cartoon of that body of magma crystallising downwards from the roof, inwards from the wall and up from the floor. And yes, there are all these convective lines here, because if you look in the field and outcrop and also down the microscope, it's actually obvious that this must have been a very vigorously convecting body of magma. So this is just setting the scene. This is the pale coloured rock that it um, was the old continental crust. There's my friend Madeline. And these are the rocks we're interested in, all these dark rocks here. This is the solidified basaltic magma that was tra trapped in the crust. And there is the edge of it here. You can see this is about a kilometre in distance we're looking at. And this is the vertical wall, a steep vertical wall. And we need to remember that it's got a vertical wall because I think that is actually quite important in understanding why it did what it did. OK, so it filled up with basalt. Here's a nice picture of basalt. And what does basalt crystallise as? Well, there are basically four minerals you need to remember. The first is olivine. And these are actually jewel-like crystals of olivine. Olivine is a magnesium silicate and it can have some iron in solution as well. And when it crystallizes these large, perfect crystals, it's, it's, you can make jewelry with it and it's called peridot. Okay, so it's a pale, it's not usually as strongly colored as this, it's often quite pale, but that's olivine. And this is, this is a picture of some basalt. This is, a, this is not from Skergard, this is just a lava flow. So this is all the basaltic magma here. And you can see little crystals. Well, they're probably, they're probably about this big crystals of olivine here. Okay, so that's what olivine looks like. That's one of the minerals we need to know. Two more minerals. You just, you don't really need to know them in any more detail than the fact that one of them is magnetite and that's an iron oxide and it's black and very, very dense. And there's a pyroxene here. This is a magnesium calcium iron silicate and there's a gem quality um, crystals here. We don't see anything quite as nice as that in Skergard. And the final one is plagioclase, which is a feldspar. Feldspars are white minerals. There's a nice big crystal of one here. And here is a picture of a basaltic lava carrying these large crystals of feldspar. So you can see them. They're white and they are, importantly, they're a very low density mineral. Okay. In contrast to magnetite, which is really dense, pyroxene is really dense as well and so is olivine, but the feldspar, that's a low density mineral. So what do we see when we're out in the field in Skergard? Well, what we can see is layering, and that layering is in terms of different colors. 
And that's because we've got different proportions of those four minerals. So the whiter layers here, that's rich in feldspar. And then the darker layers, that's rich in the olivine, the pyroxene and the magnetite. And you can see that there's banding, there's evidence here for erosion. So there were some layers here that came along and they were truncated there. So we've got new layers being put down. So what we clearly have is some kind of sedimentary system with not only deposition of minerals, but we've got gravitational sorting of those minerals in that you're grading upwards from a dense assemblage here to a low density assemblage here. And we've got erosion of the earlier formed crystals. Okay, so we can already see that this is a dynamic environment. We're dealing with magma that's flowing. There must be magmatic currents. And I should say here, this thing here is a rifle for scale. And that's because when you go to Greenland, um, not all bears are as adorable as these are. I will just let you watch this just for a few seconds because they're just so cute. Okay, they're not as nice as this usually. <laughs> So yes, we have to carry rifles with us wherever we are. So um, we can see evidence for um, magmatic currents very, very clearly because we get these, what are known as modally graded layers, right? So they're modally graded in the sense that the proportions of the minerals, the mode of the minerals varies from bottom to top. So we've got very homogeneous rock here. There's an equal mixture everywhere of those four minerals, but we get to this layer and it's really dark here and it's grading upwards to light. The dark minerals, that's the magnetite, the pyroxene, the olivine, the dense ones, and then the light one here, that's the plagioclase, the low density one. So the only way to understand this is to think in terms of a relatively quiescent solidification on the floor or accumulation of crystals on the, the magma chamber floor. And then a big plume of magma comes down and it's rich in all these crystals. And as it flows along the floor, we get gravitational sorting in terms of the relative density. So the, the, the really dense ones fall to the bottom first and then the low density ones end up at the top. And over here, you can see there's been a whole series, one, two, three, four, five, six of these events of magma flowing through. So clearly we've got um, a dynamic environment. We've got real evidence that we've got magmatic currents. And in order to get the magmatic currents, you have to have convection, okay? So this is our evidence in the field of convection. So it's just, this is a, a flume tank experiment here. This is just muddy sand and it's pouring down um, over this, um, floor here and what you'll get is the dense um, larger particles will fall to the bottom and then you'll get a fining upward sequence and that essentially is exactly what we've got here you must think of it in terms of one of those um, these uh, currents here and in this little cartoon you can see them they're pouring down off the floor so we've got this relatively unstable mushy layer developing on that vertical wall remember it's a vertical wall and every so often you get collapse and you'll get one of these currents pouring down. And that's one of the major components of the convective system in this large body of magma. Um, where am I going? Right, okay. So this is another example of evidence of a magmatic current coming down. So this is a lovely sunny day. It's not always as nice and sunny as that. And we're going to zoom in on this here. So here you've got, um, I always use a rifle for scale most of the time because these things are so awkward to carry. They're the first thing you put down. As soon as you arrive where you're going, it's the first thing you put on the ground because you're so fed up with it. Okay, so we've got nice smooth layers here, but every so often we had a powerful current coming down and that current eroded what was already on the floor. You can see it eating into those layers. It's truncating the layers. So there's a layer coming along here, might not show very clearly, but clearly this is being eating into the floor and then it drops its crystal load as the flow wanes, okay? Very, very clearly, we've got a very, very dynamic environment here. And now if we go over here, 
So this is the reason why I showed you this rather complicated geological map. We're now going near the wall. So there's the wall, the vertical wall. And we're looking at this little region here. And this is one of Lawrence Wage's original maps from the 1930s. We're looking at some very interesting structures which are mapped out as these axes here. These look like that in the field. So there isn't a person for scale here, but a person will be about that big on this image. And what we can see is relatively homogeneous rock here. And then we've got this extraordinary stack of crescentic layers. This is known as a trough band. And it's actually, you need to think of it like a bit of guttering. So I'm standing with the wall of the intrusion behind me. I'm looking into the intrusion. This is the center of the intrusion over here. This is an elongate semicircular cross-sectioned pipe, like a river channel, which we've had lots and lots of currents pouring down. There's another example here, and you can see these um, individual packets modally graded. So they start dark and they go up to light. And then there's a bit of peace and quiet, and then you get another one. So you can think of these, these are plumes, crystal rich bodies of magma falling off the vertical wall, which is just behind you in this image here, falling off the vertical wall. They're rich in crystals because that vertical wall is falling apart and they come pouring down and they go along these, these channels like this, dropping their crystal load as they come. Um, let's just go, oh, where am I now? This is, sorry about this. I need to find where I was. I was there. Okay, cool. So this is just a little close up of those individual layers. And importantly, you can see that some of these crescentic layers are truncated by the next ones up. This means that that channel is just shifting across every now and then it will shift. So it just eats into the walls of the previous channel. There's another very clear example here. So there's, there's a channel and it, the, the center of gravity shifted sideways for this one, and that was stayed in the same place. And then it shifted again like this. And you can see very, very clearly these modally graded layers. So this base bit here is really packed in those dense magnetite crystals and pyroxene crystals. Whereas at the top of the layer, that's where you see the low density plagioclase. Okay, and now importantly, if we look in detail in those channels, we see that there is a preferred alignment of the elongate plagioclase feldspar. So a long way from the channels, can you see these little grains here, these little elongate grains, they're totally randomly oriented all over the place. But if we go into the channel right next door, can you see, we're now looking down on those layers. So this is us looking down. They're not sticking up these things, they're actually lying down in the plane. So my boot is just out of shot over here. So you can see them all lined, they're all elongate and aligned. And this is because the magmatic current that deposited them organized them all to make what's known as a lineation. Okay, so not only do we have the modal grading, you know, the dense bits at the bottom grading up into the low density material, but all the elongate grains are also aligned. Definitely magmatic current. So the idea is basically this, um, Neil Irvine did a lot of work on this. So this is one of his little diagrams. So you imagine the wall is over here. These crystal laden currents are pouring down the wall, pouring along these long lived channels here and just depositing these crescentic layers, nice gravity, um, gravity sorted layers. Okay. It's obviously dynamic sedimentary environment. Now the next stage, okay, we've been in the field, we've collected our rocks, we've made lots and lots of observations, lots of fabulous photographs, but actually what we need to do is look at it a bit more close up. So to do this, we need a microscope. And you think, well, how on earth can you look at a rock down a microscope? Well, what you do is make a thin section. So you make yourself a little chip. See this little chip here? This is being cut with a diamond saw. And you might think this looks horribly dangerous. My God, why isn't he wearing full body armor? Well, actually it's just little diamonds here and it cuts the rock by grinding it. And the worst you can do to yourself is cut off, you know, grind away a bit of fingernail, but you'd actually have to forcibly push your hand against this blade to make any difference at all. Okay, it's perfectly safe. Right, so you cut your little block there. 
you stick your little block onto a piece of glass here, and then you're going to cut off most of the block with another diamond saw. So here it is, most of it's cut off. It's now about half a millimeter thick. And the next thing you've got to do is grind it down. And you grind it and grind it and grind it until it's 30 microns thick. So this is a thin section, okay? Most minerals are now translucent. At 30 microns, you can see through the rock, okay? And this is what we use with the microscope slide. You can see lots of little black dots on this one. This is magnetite. Magnetite is not translucent even at 30 microns. You have to go down to five or something before the light will start get, getting through. And so we have that um, standard thickness of 30 microns. So this is what a thin section looks like. Um, this is actually a basalt. Most of this is basalt. It's finely crystalline. So this is a couple of centimetres across just to give you an idea of size. And then this, this remember plagioclase feldspar, it looks white in um, hand specimen. And that means that when you grind it down, it's going to be completely see-through. So we've got these little crystals of plagioclase feldspar here. Now, what we do as petrologists is we, we use plain polarised light coming through the bottom of this thin section. And then we have another polarizer at the top and we look at it under crossed polars because we've got lots of diagnostic features that will only show up when we've got cross polarized light. So when we put the second polarizer in, that plagioclase suddenly shows up as these crystals here. They go gray for reasons that I'm not going to explain <laughs> because that's first year geology. OK, and you can see twins in there. But what I want you to see is, you know, with the polarizer in, plagioclase turns out to have stripes in it. OK, that's what it looks like down the microscope. Um, I keep losing my pointer here. Right, what does the rest of that rock look like down the microscope? Um, right, so this is the colourless plagioclase. We've seen that already. This is now coarse grained. This is now this is now about four millimetres across, nice coarse grained rock. That's the magnetite, the magnetite there, remember. Magnetite is not see-through. It's opaque down the microscope, even at 30 microns. The olivine, it's pale green in hand specimen. So when you shave it down to 30 microns, it loses most of that colour. So that's the olivine here. And the pyroxene is this brown stuff. Now, when we put the analyzer in, this is what it looks like. Now, you know, plagioclase looks gray and stripy. There's your plagioclase, very, very easy to spot. Olivine goes all these beautiful colors, absolutely lovely colors for reasons that I'm not going to go into, but it makes it very, very easy to see. And then the pyroxene, it does go some interesting colors, but this particular grain doesn't. Okay, that's what it looks like down the microscope. Now, let's look at those rocks from the trough bands. What do they look like? Well, there's a series of images here. And what you can see is an awful lot of grey, stripy stuff. These grains here, you now know, are plagioclase feldspar. You see, there's all plagioclase feldspar. We're looking at the top bit of those trough layers where it's really, really pale in the field. But what should leap out at you is the fact that this looks like a, like a pile of Lego bricks just tossed into a box. OK, all these little crystals have got perfectly sort of square shapes and they're just jostled together. And there's really not been any recrystallization or any flattening or any anything. So this is what a sandstone looks like down the microscope. This is a sedimentary rock. A sedimentary rock. So, you know, it's, it didn't crystallize in situ. This is, a, this is a, an accumulation of crystals that, as we surmised from the field, was dropped out of a magmatic current rolling along the floor. OK, this is everything we see here. It's a magmatic sediment. And this is just a pretty image here showing this is now color coded for composition. So this shows the plagioclase feldspar grains now as blue things. There's a solid solution in plagioclase feldspar between sodium and calcium, and that's what the different gradations of um, colours are. But what we can see is that the cement, the final bit of cement here, is just infilling the spaces. So we can see the original shapes of that sediment when it was dropped onto the floor of the magma chamber. Okay, We're looking at a really, really dynamic environment. And the other thing we can do is do something funky called electron backscatter diffraction. And we can actually take, this is a thin section here, and there's another one there and another one there. And this is going through one of those layers. So it's actually through one of these layers here. 
Okay, the, I use fridge magnets in the field because it's a very good way of, of um, showing in a photograph exactly where our samples are from. So I just steal these from the kitchen and take them out into the field for my photographs. Anyways, so one of the samples is from here. So you've got the magnetite rich layer here, grading up into the plagioclase. And electron backscatter diffraction tells you the crystallographic orientation of every single grain that you can see in the thin section. And we can now see that preferred orientation of the three crystallographic axes of the plagioclase crystals. So this is telling us that every single plagioclase crystal has got exactly the same alignment. Okay, so these are the elongate grains being aligned in this particular layer by that magmatic current. Okay, so very, very dynamic environment. So yes, what happened in Skergard? Well, in the field, there's masses of evidence for sedimentation, reworking, and by that I mean erosion um, of mush by magmatic currents. We've got those strong fabrics, those preferred alignments of the crystals also created by the magmatic currents. There's no other way they can happen. We've got evidence for currents pouring off these steep walls. And so that most of the convection is probably driven by this cooling from the walls and the roof and, and um, a large part of the convective cell, if you like, is these currents pouring off the walls. So yes, it's absolutely clear. Um, basaltic magma chambers on the kilometre scale must undergo convection during cooling. Nice evidence. But, you know, this is kilometre scale. What happens if we're looking at something that's smaller, much smaller? So for this, we're going to now look at sills. So a sill is a tabular intrusion, mostly horizontal, um, mostly parallel to bedding, if there's any bedding there. So this is a couple of pictures of a really famous, well, to geologists, set of sills in Antarctica related to the splitting off of Antarctica from South America and the opening of the, um, well, South America and Africa, the opening of the South Atlantic. So this is all basaltic magma coming up here. And this is sort of stepping up, um, crossing all these different layers in the sedimentary rock. But this one here, you can see it's pretty much horizontal going along these um, sedimentary layers. Okay, so let's now think in terms of a tabular intrusion. So it's sort of pretty much infinite in extent laterally, but it's got a finite thickness, right? That's what a sill is. And the sill I'm going to tell you about is in the Shients. So I don't know how good your geography is. This is northwest Scotland. This is the Isle of Skye. That's Harris. And this is North Uist. So these are the outer isles, the outer western isles. This is the, the Minch, which is um, a good seaway. And the Shients are there in the middle of nowhere. So this photograph here shows the view from the Isle of Harris standing here looking out. So you can see the Scottish mainland over here with some snow on the hills. And these are the islands that we're looking at. Now those islands are almost all sill. There's nothing else. These are sills that are associated with the opening of the North Atlantic. They're the same age as the Skergard. And it's all to do with that plume that's currently underneath Iceland. And it's pretty much everything we could see in these islands is sill because basalt is a nice hard rock and it doesn't erode very easily. So the sediments that it intruded into have now been eroded away and we're just left with these absolutely fabulous cliffs with beautiful columnar jointing um, of this basalt. And this is a composite sill, meaning there were several batches of magma that came in um, but the whole thing is almost 170 meters thick. But the particular bit of it we're going to look at is the youngest bit that's about 140, 145 meters thick. Importantly, the magma that filled this carried a load of olivine crystals. So it's called a crystal cargo, if you like. So the magma that came was a basaltic magma, but on its way up from wherever it was sitting in the crust, it stole a whole load of olivine grains. So it came in looking like this. Now you need to remember that you've got a fairly runny magma. So the viscosity of a basalt is about the same as high quality tomato ketchup. 
and it's holding an enlarged number of these crystals. And these crystals are going to sink to the floor. Okay. And in fact, that's pretty much what happened. So there's a nice little diagram here from a paper by Fergus Gibb, which shows the composite nature of this sill. So it's about 168 meters like this. There was an early, um, an early component here and here, and it was split by the one that we're interested in. So it came in carrying these olivine crystals and they're now almost all on the floor. Okay, they settled on the floor of this sill because they're dense. So we can look at this in detail. So there's a nice sort of stratigraphic column through this sill. This bit here, we're not going to take any notice of. This is the early bit. We're looking at this bit from here up to here, okay? So um, it's got two different rock types. This type down here is really olivine rich, and that bit there is really olivine poor. And this line here shows the volume proportion of olivine that there is in this sill. So it's really high here. High meaning if you had all those olivine grains and you poured them into a bucket, the volume proportion that we have is what you get if they were just formed a touching mechanically strong framework, okay? You couldn't get any more olivine than that unless you squished them together and formed and, and, and caused them you know, to, to solidify and sinter into something more olivine rich. Okay, so it's an olivine framework at the bottom and then it rapidly drops off and then there's virtually none here. And then you get a little hiccup at the top. Ah, now the reason I've shown you this, this is a thin section view of the chill zone. So this is the magma that came in and it instantaneously chilled at the wall. So you get a snapshot of what the magma looked like when it arrived. So remember I was saying that it looked like this. Well, this in thin section is what it looks like. So that is that matrix. This is a, the liquid that's crystallized very quickly. And then every one of these is an olivine grain. Remember they colorless in thin section because they lose that pale color when they go down to 30 microns. So you can see, yes, this magma was coming in and it had this load of olivine crystals. And this is just, this is about a centimeter and a half across, something like that. Okay. Um, let me just, right. So what I've done, what I'm gonna do now is show you a series of sketches um, of what the thin sections look like. So our sample is pretty much at the bottom here. And I've got two images. These are two photographs like that previous one. So I take this one and I draw around every single one of those grains and color it in black. And this is what all the olivines look like. This is the spacing, this is the size distribution. This is, I think this is four millimeters across here. Okay, so they're quite small grains, but you know, that's the size of them. So that's what they look like right down here. Just remember that in your mind's eye. Um, so this is just um, settling out of that olivine cargo. Now we're going to move up a bit. So now we've come up about 10 meters from the bottom. Can you see there's less olivine there, which we know because you know we're, we're seeing a decrease in the olivine volume proportion, but they're also getting smaller, okay? Um, but now what's happening is, oh, I should also say, oops, that we've got a lot of isolated grains here, lots and lots of isolated grains. There are some little grain clusters here obviously but quite a lot of um, isolated grains. As we go up though what we start seeing is almost no isolated grains, there's a few. Most of the grains now are forming clusters, polycrystalline clusters and those clusters have got nice grain boundaries. They're essentially sintered clusters, okay. This is what they look like in thin section. So this is there's our plagioclase. Remember, plagioclase is colorless. We can't see it at all. This is our pyroxene. This here is our opaque magnetite. <coughs> and the crystals that we're interested in here, these are the olivines, pale color. And we, we, it's quite hard to tell whether they're separate crystals here. So that's why you put the analyzer in. You put the analyzer in and you get these different colors for each crystal, depending on exactly the crystallographic orientation. So you can see this cluster is made of 
dozens of crystals, absolutely dozens. And this is, remember, is only a two dimensional slice through a three dimensional cluster. There could be a hundred crystals in this cluster if we had the whole thing in three dimensions. And importantly, um, they're really well sintered nice grain boundaries between them. And it's a really complex object in three dimensions. So this cluster must have formed before it ended up on the sill floor, okay? Must have formed prior to it being deposited. Um, right. So we're going higher up now. This is higher still. And um, we've got even fewer isolated grains. And those clusters are getting bigger still, more and more grains. And they're even bigger now. Look, we're now at the top of the olivine rich, well, olivine bearing. There's almost no olivine um, left by this point, but the clusters are enormous. Look how many grains there must be in three dimensions in this. It's absolutely astonishing. And olivine normally grows as little rounded egg shaped grains, right? Whereas if you look at this grain here, that's not an egg shape. That's really elongate. And that's because there must have been grain growth after the cluster had formed. Because once you've got three grains stuck together, that grain in the middle can't grow sideways anymore because there are other grains in the way. So it can only grow up and down. So we've the original grains in this cluster may have been that size. And there's been lots and lots of growth after cluster formation. Okay. And if we, it, there's, there's no olivine here, but now if we look at the roof, if we go close to the roof, we see an analogous thing, these really enormous clusters, not many of them, but they're still there. So there's not much olivine there, but the olivine that we have is in clusters, in these long lived clusters that must have had a lot of grain growth after they formed. And we go further up still, we're right up here now, and now we go to tiny grains and no clusters, right? So that's really interesting. How on earth do we explain this? So if we just took it on a very, very simplistic level, say, so right, okay, the basalt came in, it had loads and loads of little olivine crystals in it as a crystal cargo. The olivine has got high density. So the olivine is clearly just going to sink to the floor and it'll just sink to the floor and then you'll be left with an olivine free zone. Okay, fine, we can think about that. But what we'd expect is that if we had a crystal cargo that had a variety of different sizes of olivines. The large ones are going to sink for first, faster. So you're going to end up with the large ones on the floor. And then as you go up, you're going to see the smaller and smaller and smaller ones. That's called a fining upward sequence. And it's exactly analogous to that modally graded layers that we were looking up in Scareguard, where it's a gravitational sorting. Whereas this gravitational sorting is on size rather than mineralogy. And in fact, when we look at the bottom here, we do see a finding upward sequence. There it is, that's our finding upward sequence. Mostly individual crystals here, they, this is what they look like, an individual olivine crystals like this, individual and rounded. That makes sense, this is just simple settling. But then everything goes a bit pear-shaped. Now, as we're looking at this zone here, okay, we've got less and less olivine there, but what we have, what little olivine we have is becoming incorporated into bigger and bigger clusters, okay? So we've got a coarsening upwards instead of fining upwards in this upper part here. And this is the critical thing. This is the fingerprint of convection, okay? So just to run through the, um, the observations that we have, if we look at the bottom 10 meters, it's a finding upwards, the coarse tail grading, you don't need to worry about that. That just basically means that we lose the big ones first. Okay, we go, so this is just basically settling, no, no um, problem with that. And then the rest of it, we've got coarsening upwards. So even individual crystals are getting bigger upwards. And we've got these huge clusters and the cluster size is also increasing upwards. So what we must have now is settling from a convecting liquid, right? So if we think of settling from a static liquid, then um, yes, we just basically get a gravity sorted finding upwards layer. If the liquid is convecting, 
If the convective velocity is higher than the settling velocity, those grains will be kept suspended for a long time. They can still settle out of a convecting liquid because at the base of a convecting layer, you've got a stagnant boundary layer, right? As the velocity changes from going down, it'll go along the floor and then go back up again. So once they're in this region here where the, the current is going along the floor, they can settle out. So you've got a randomly moving crystals in this convecting layer, but as soon as they, or if they get into the stagnant boundary layer at the bottom, they can just drop out. But it's a stochastic process. It's just by chance whether they get there. So it takes time. It takes longer than settling from a static liquid. And it's a random process. So um, you need to consider the fact that we've got the crystals being suspended in the, in the convecting magma. But the whole thing, the whole body is cooling. So those crystals continue to grow. And the longer they stay in the convecting magma, the longer it takes for them just to end up at the bottom, the bigger they're going to be, okay? So with time, the overall grain size in that settled layer will increase because the ones at the top are the ones that stayed able to grow in the convecting liquid for longest. And when you've got lots of different crystals bobbing around, they're going to bang into each other. And as they bang into each other, they make these clusters. And clearly the longer you have, i.e. the longer you have before you accidentally find yourself in that bottom boundary layer, the more crystals you can accrete in your cluster and the bigger those crystals can be. So that's what we must be looking at. We're looking at settling from a convecting liquid in order to get that. And the interesting thing is that the uppermost part here mirrors this. So we get lots of fine, fine crystals here. They must be trapped very early on. And then later, remember it's crystallizing downwards from the roof. Later, we're seeing those older clusters. So you get large clusters here because they're the old ones. And they are getting brought up and trapped there by the convecting currents. Okay. So just to, just to demonstrate that this isn't just um, pie in the sky, I can put some numbers onto this. So cooling timescales, how long did it take for 140 metres of magma to solidify? Well, we can think in terms of a characteristic timescale for cooling. And this characteristic timescale tau is just given by the half thickness of the sill squared, pi squared times kappa, where that's the thermal conductivity. So the sort of characteristic timescale we're looking at is about 20 years. We're looking at decades, okay, for this whole thing to, to cool even slightly. But if we actually think about it properly and do it in a rigorous way, if we're assuming conductive heat loss through the roof and the floor, and it needs to solidify in this solidification interval here, we're talking about 100 years. Okay, so these, this is the decades to hundreds of years. That's the time scale we've got to play with. Um, oops. Right. Um, now let's think about the fact that we've got olivine stuck at the top of the sill. The sill is solidifying downwards, right? So how quickly can it solidify downwards relative to the settling speed of the olivines in the crystal cargo? Well, the settling speed of olivines is given by the Stokes settling velocity, which is some probably familiar with you. Um, and uh, we can put in some sensible numbers here. The olivine is found 10 meters below the top of the sill. So, you know, it's the time taken to sink 10 meters. How, how fast is that relative to the time scale for cooling? Well, the time scale for cooling, if we, if we use this sort of time scale here, in order for the olivines to be trapped within 10 meters, i.e. for the sill to have crystallized 10 meters before the olivine sunk out of the way and escaped, the viscosity needs to be 100, 300, 100 to 1,000 times more than it is likely to be, okay? So there's no way that that olivine was trapped at the roof by the downwards propagation of that solidification front. The only way we could have found olivine at the top there is if it was continuously being brought up. It wasn't allowed to, to, to settle or down to the bottom. It was continually brought up in convection. 
So we have our downwards crystallizing front and the olivine is going like this and occasionally it gets trapped, okay? So that's another proof positive that this thing must have been convecting. Okay, so this is just showing um, timescales for settling from convecting magma. So this Stokes settling velocity is essentially for a static magma, okay? But I was talking about this business of, of sort of stochastic loss of crystals. If they, if they go into this stagnant boundary layer, they are lost, no matter how vigorous the convection. So we can think in terms of a half-life of retention of crystals in um, a convecting magma. And for the height that we have, 140 meters, and for the settling velocities that we have, just Stokes settling velocities, the half-life for crystal retention in a magma like this is goes from about a month to two years, approximately, just depending on how, how um, viscous we make our magma be, okay? Going from one to 100 Pascal seconds. So most of the olivine crystals would finally have settled out after about five half-lives, so about 10 years. So the timescales of this are all okay. The whole thing took about 100 years to solidify, but in the early stages, it was losing all that olivine to form that um, accumulation on the floor. The first bit of it, that was fining upwards. That was most of the olivine cargo that came in. But then there were always little seeds left around in the convecting magma for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, something like that. And then they grew and accreted to form these clusters. And slowly but surely, they were lost from the convective system. And that gave us this coarsening upward sequence. There's no other way of explaining that coarsening upward sequence with the clusters. It can't be done. Oh, and the final piece of the jigsaw is how long does it take to sinter these crystals? Sintering basically means to make these beautiful polygranular objects with smooth um, grain boundaries, you know, 100% solid. This is sintering, this is what material scientists do. The critical time scale or the characteristic time scale for sintering is given by this confusing equation here. And you don't need to remember this equation. The only thing you need to come out of it is that the time scale to make these clusters look like this is again, perfectly reasonable. We can do this, this absolutely works, okay? So yeah. The whole thing fits together in terms of time scales. So I'll just rattle through what happened. Right, so we had that magma come in with loads and loads of olivine crystals. Most of them fell onto the floor. Most of them did, okay, right at the beginning to make this beautiful finding upward sequence. Some were left in the um, convecting magma. And I should say, yes, virtually nothing was trapped up here. Almost no olivine up there because settling was too fast. Then we get convection kicking in big time, okay? Maybe there was a tiny delay in onset because there were so many olivine crystals in the, in the magma that it that would, made the viscosity too high and it couldn't convect. But as soon as we dropped out most of it onto the floor to form that fining upwards thing, then it could start to convect. But not all the olivines settled out because their Stokes velocity is too small. They're the ones that are now whizzing around in this convecting magma and they're starting to grow. And they can only escape this convective motion if they, if they got large and um, formed big clusters and got to the, um, the stagnant boundary layer at the bottom, okay? So some of those olivine grains and clusters were brought up to the roof by um, upwelling convection currents. And at this point here, there's no more olivine left. Okay, so we can see it crystallizing down from the roof, up from the floor, that last little bit that crystallized, well actually it's 40 meters of it. This is quite a big body. The last 40 meters has hardly got any olivine in it at all. Right, so we can summarize. Clues to convection in now solid igneous rocks. On the outcrop, when you're out in the field, evidence of gravity sorting is really, really obvious because of the different, the way the different minerals behave. It's a compositional gravity sorting. We can also see evidence of erosion of pre previously existing layers. And that must be the movement of currents, vigorous currents, convective currents, and then a deposition from those currents as well. So essentially it's like a sedimentary environment. It's like a beach. 
well, not quite like a beach, the, the Reynolds number is slightly different, but you know, it's a sedimentary environment with erosion and deposition. On the grain scale, you need your microscope now, well, unless they're really obvious, like those plagioclase grains in Scareguard, you can actually see them in the field. You can see there's a preferred alignment. Preferred alignment is because the magma's moving it around. We can look for evidence for grains behaving like separate particles. Again, this is microscopy. Does it look like a sandstone? Do we see the evidence that these grains are just being dumped down? And then the clever bit, well, I say clever because I did it, but you look at the settled crystal loads, look at the grain size variation, look at the morphology. Are these polycrystalline um, clusters? What's going on? And that's you know, the evidence in the olivine, in, in the Sheehan cell is absolutely conclusive. It must have convected. It's a really, really nice story. So the next question, the thing that is going to um, occupy me for the next N years, where N is an unknown integer, is um, what happens in stickier magma bodies? So both Sheant and Skergard, those basalts, nice and runny, um, easily convecting. But as we um, keep magmas in the crust for longer and they carry on crystallizing, they tend to get stickier, higher viscosity. So I want to push now into the stickier magmas and see what they look like. See if there's any evidence for any kind of magma flow, convection, sedimentation, erosion, anything in those bodies there. Okay. So that's me done. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Hornes, many, many thanks for a fantastic talk. And uh, now it's time for a Q&A session. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, either write them to the YouTube chat or you can join the Zoom call. I can't see the chat from here. Is that, can uh, you I'm looking at it. Um, there are no questions so far. Okay. That's right. Isn't there something with the Mars lander being live streamed at the moment? Oh, uh, is something yeah, happening? It should be, but I think, huh. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know the timing of it. I know it's tonight sometime. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know. So. We've got someone in the waiting room. Yeah. Are you going to admit them? Yeah. yeah. You've got your, your audios off. Okay. Hello. Uh, so thank you for the talk. Pleasure. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for the talk. I just wondered. So at the end, you said that you'd like to look at stickier magma bodies. What would you expect to be different about them uh, precisely? I wouldn't expect them to have as much evidence for magmatic currents or evidence for settling. Um, but I'd really like to know, I mean, there's a whole range of viscosities. So basalt's the runniest, well, almost the runniest, and granite, granitic magmas are really, really sticky. But there's a whole range, a continuous range of compositions between the basalt and the, and the granite. And I want to know at what point along that trajectory do we lose all this evidence for magma flow? Ah, that okay. is what I, I want. See. Yeah. Okay, how sticky is it before it all shuts down? Okay, well, thank you. It was an excellent talk, by the way. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Did you do Geology 1A? Oh, no, uh, I do maths, so something completely different. Oh, oh you've missed out. See, Jindra did 1A. Yeah. <laughs> But now I do physics and mathematics. <laughs> I, uh, yes. Well, thanks very much. Well, well, thank you for the talk. Uh, see you later, I suppose. Definitely. Well, I hope so. I hope we all get back in person as, as quickly as possible. That would be nice. Wouldn't it just?
This is someone else who's connecting to audio. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was gonna type. Uh, I was just wondering whether you could find these old living granules on the, say, ascending side of the wall. So at the top, it's cooling, and at the like, it's cooling from the bottom up as well. But you also said it could be cooling from the sides. Yeah. So assuming like coming down side. Also, I was wondering whether current is always on the on one direction, if that kind of makes sense. Oh, yes, yes. So I think the current is always in one direction in the trough bands, because the trough bands are very, very close to the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's a very specific current that's pouring off the walls. Mm -hmm. But no, I think the currents are pretty random. It's just oh. that, so in, unfortunately, with geology, you're pretty much stuck with what you can see on the surface. And you could see from the map and actually from the photos as well, that there's an awful lot of glaciers covering mm -hmm quite a bit of Skergard. So the bits I'd really like to look at are either extremely steep mountains or covered in ice. So we, like, we, we can only really use what we have. And that's that area where the trough bands are is coincidentally almost the easiest bit to access. Mm. It's, where, it's where everyone camps. It's, the, it's where the sensible campsite is. And when Wager was there, Wager overwintered there in 1935-36, and he even built a little house there. Oh, that's sweet. Isn't it? A nice yeah. house. Yeah, you can just see some remnants of it. I mean, the Inuit came and um, recycled it after a while. Oh. Yeah. So we are a bit um, hampered by the, the erosion surface. Where has it eroded to? Um, how easy is it to get there? So mm -hmm. um, what I'd love to do is to be able to map out all the different current directions in three dimensions, but you can't, you can only ever do it in two oh. dimensions because you, you only ever have the surface. So yeah, you, you, can get, you can get three dimensional information if you do a drill core. So there are lots yeah. of drill cores through Skergard because it's, um, it's a gold deposit apart from anything else. But in order to do the sort of detailed work that I want to do, a drill core is not really enough because you mm. don't know how it was oriented in space. I mean, you know, it was vertical, but you don't know how yeah, much yeah. there's been. And mm. it's also, you'd need, you need big areas to see things in detail. And it's, it's like a one dimensional sample, a drill hole. Yeah. But these are just the problems that geologists work with. There's always an incomplete data set. Part of the training of a geologist is to learn how to interpolate between the known points. It's not like maths, for example, where you can work <laughs> out everything. Does that answer? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That was great. Yeah, we have a question in the YouTube chat, so I, I will read it. Thank you so much for the talk. You mentioned about grain fabrics of pleasure clays being able to determine currents in basaltic lava. Is it possible to do the same thing to olivin crystals? Are there any evidence for the alignment of the olivin clusters, for example? Um, that's a really, really good question. So to get alignment, the best alignments are for minerals that grow with really non-equant shapes. Like I grow as a pencil or, I mean, plagioclase is often this sort of shape. So the further away it is from a sphere, the easier it is for it to be aligned. And olivine tends to grow as a sort of bean-like shape. So if it does have an alignment, it's not usually a very strong one but that it, it, it is actually aligned in the trough bands. It's just not as astonishingly obvious as the plagioclase. I mean, you can see the plagioclase alignment in the field. It just jumps out at you. But um, nobody's done any sort of alignment work on the Sheant clusters. For that, you would need, because they're very large and three-dimensional and irregular, um, I imagine a good way of doing it would be tomography, x-ray tomography. And you could get a picture of them in three dimensions that way. But it would be tricky. 
So yes, you can see it. You can see current directions in olivine as long as the olivine's not growing in a too spherical a shape. But the clusters is a difficult one. Is that a good answer? Are they happy with that? Yeah, I, I hope so. Maybe. Uh, maybe they'll write to the YouTube chat. So, yeah, yeah, there's um, answer. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Good. You know, you can always ping me an email, guys. If there's questions that you think of in the middle of tonight or tomorrow or whatever, my email is on it's on the Trinity website. You can just email me. Just and, and I'll be more than happy to answer. There are no more questions so far, so maybe let's wait a yeah. let's wait a while and then so. everyone can go and have their dinner. Oh, there's a question again. There's a hand up. Ah. Uh, so um, there might be a bit generic question, but I see it like you have to travel to other countries quite a lot. Um, how does a collaboration with other, like researchers from other countries usually happen? Um, well, so, the, the way it's supposed to happen is that you start thinking of a scientific problem and you think, where is the best place um, that I could address this problem? Mm -hmm. And then you, you contact the people who are already working in that area, maybe. But there are some people who think, actually, where do I want to go? <laughs> what, problem, <laughs> what problem would I like to look at? How can I get an excuse to go to <laughs> But um, I, I started working on the problem of magma chambers by looking at the Scottish examples. I did lots and lots of work in Scotland and I published on that. And then Skergard is like the iconic version. But by the time I thought I'd like to look at Skergard, I'd already published enough that the people who did work on Skergard were quite keen to work with me. Oh. So it was very, very easy. And they're mostly based in Denmark because you know, Greenland, yeah. Does it still belong to Denmark? I mean, I know they're getting some independence, but it was Danish for a long time. So I teamed up with some people from the Danish Geological Survey. Um, I mean, you might guess from the photographs that the logistics of working in East Greenland are awful. <laughs> um, you get around by helicopter a lot of the time or you need a ship um, and it needs to be an ice, an ice um, reinforced ship. Um, yeah. And you need firearms and shipping firearms from the UK is an absolute nightmare. There's so much <laughs> work, it's just a disaster. Whereas if you work with the Danes, it's absolutely routine. You know, oh. I remember I walked, I, I, I walked into, um, so we, one year, a couple of years, we took a charter plane from Iceland and um, the Danes said, oh, it's a fine, fine. You can pick up the rifles from Iceland, it's fine. So I walked into this guy's room, you know, to say that we were, we'd arrived and we needed our plane and all the rifles and the ammunition were just sitting on his sofa, just handed them, <laughs> here you are. So you know, that sort of logistical thing just gets all sorted out if you work with people who are used to working in that area. And actually I work as, I work in part of a team. I mean, that's what I'd prefer to do, I, I prefer, collaborating so the more people the better we and need definitely because of like what the field is like you have to it's it's bound to you have to like travel around i suppose yeah, so yeah. You, you've got to be that to actually yes absolutely yes yeah i mean nothing beats actually being there and making your own observations mm -hmm. and critically collecting exactly the right samples because you can't let anyone else collect the samples because they will almost invariably get the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it really matters, you know, within centimeters, it matters what you get. Yeah. So you have to do it yourself. Yeah. I'm not complaining. I mean, I, I like doing it myself. I'd much prefer <laughs> to be in control of the whole, the whole process. Thank you. That sounds so exciting. <laughs> Thanks.
Great. So, are there any more questions? Yeah, it seems that there are no more questions. Great. So, Professor Holness, many thanks for your great talk and for answering the questions. Pleasure. Uh, Pleasure to be invited. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. And next Thursday, there will be a talk about CRISPR and gene editing by Professor Martin Inek from University of Zurich. The talk is going to start at the usual time at quarter past six UK time. Thank you for attending the talk and have a nice evening. Bye.